billion dollars on the expiration of outer space. Twenty-four billion. Now, for the last three years, they had spent three billion. Three billion dollars would have fed every hungry person in America. We are here to say that what we can do for space and exploration, we must do, and we demand that we do the very same for starving poor people. Okay, Jules, we're getting close. We're getting close. This is Apollo Saturn launch control. We passed the six-minute mark in our countdown for Apollo 11. Now five minutes, 52 seconds and counting. Launch director Rocco Patron now gives the go. We're five minutes, 20 seconds and counting. You go into your final replenishment cycle. Make sure you get the amount of fuel on board. You then start pressurizing. You start going through steps leading right up to the moment of commitment. What I refer to as the moment of truth. The vehicle starting to pressurize as far as the propellant tanks are concerned, and all is still go. Computer supervises hundreds of events occurring over these last few minutes. Two minutes, ten seconds, and counting. Oxidizer tanks in the second and third stages now have pressurized. We had all these umbilical arms. We had like ten different umbilical arms that weighed tons each. It were all linked to it. The swing arm now coming back as our countdown continues. Skip Chauvin informing the astronauts that the swing arm now coming back. And then all of a sudden, when all the arms were back, you realized that they were sitting there by themselves. The next closest person was at least five miles away, and they were sitting on millions of gallons of propellants. Neil Armstrong reported back when he received the good wishes. Thank you very much. We know it will be a good flight. I mean, there's no turning back once that rocket lifted off, and uh, this was the moment and it was getting very close to, uh, to getting down to T minus zero. All the second stage tanks now pressurized. 35 seconds and counting. We are still go with Apollo 11. 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. people uh, base their thoughts of what a launch is like on what they see in the movies. The transition from being on the ground to actually in motion was so gentle that none of us really, other than hearing the count go to zero and someone saying liftoff, and we could see the instruments begin to change that would start to change at liftoff. Other than that, there wasn't a great physical sensation at all. roughly 300 or so feet beneath it. And the vibration then hits the control center and the windows start to shake. And great feeling, but also no, you, the apprehension is there. Yes, we had reached the moment that uh, really the world had waited for.
There is really nothing to say about it. What can you say about a site like that? Here we got a roll program. Neil Armstrong reporting the roll and pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. Downrange one mile, altitude three, four miles now. Balance cup log. Stay down there. Thousand feet high, 80 feet uh, per second vertical rise. And a minute or so after that unbelievable event, the astronauts are talking to the ground and reporting on the facts and figures of the flight. And somebody here a minute ago was saying they are as matter of fact and unexcited and calm as if there were taxi cab drivers reporting in and saying we're on Maple Street headed for downtown. 11 Houston, you are go at four minutes. With the spacecraft safely on its way, control of the flight passed from the launch team to mission control in Houston, Texas. For the next eight days, the control room would run the mission in three teams. Apollo 11, this is Houston. Its trajectory and guidance look good, and the stage is good. Over. Apollo 11, Hatch. 35,000 feet per second. Cut off. Flight director of the white team was Gene Krantz, nicknamed by his controllers General Savage. This was uh, the world's greatest adventure, and we were participants in this thing. We were truly making it happen. In the front of the control room, in what was known as the trench, sat Steve Bales. He was controller of navigation and guidance, Guido for short. Even though we were young, 24, 25, 26, I was 26, we, um, we were the only experience anybody had in manned spaceflight, monitoring it. So... People would come to the control center and say, what are all these kids doing here? Standby for mode four capability. For mode four. Mark, mode four capability. We were very well aware that uh, we could change not only the course of missions, the course of our programs, but possibly the course of history through the decisions we made. And we were willing to do that. Using the service propulsion system. PDQ 602 up here. Altitude is 100 miles, downrange 883 miles. All communication between Mission Control and the Apollo 11 crew went through the capsule communicator, or CAPCOM. In this key role was Charlie Duke, himself an astronaut. You know, the astronauts got the glory. They were the ones riding. They were the ones in the spacecraft. But without that team of people that was pyramided under them, you couldn't do it alone. There were 400,000.